my main takeaway is that there is a cure for sickle cell disease. There's been a cure, but now there's like a cure, right? People need to know that there is a cure. And it's not experimental. It's not like this new thing that has just happened. It's been around for a while, and we're making it better and better. And we're making it available to not just children, but also adults. And so Dr. Carroll's talk talked about using a mother or a father as a half match to do the bone marrow transplant, and the successes are impressive. You know, they had 90% of the patients do very, very well, and they had improvements in their brain function, in their memory, in their um, uh, ex exercise activity, that everything got better. Um, it's not, you know, a walk in the park, it's not benign, but there is an opportunity to cure your disease no matter what age you are. And I think that's the biggest thing that I want people to take away from here is sickle cell disease is now a disease of all ages. And the treatments have to be treatments for everybody of all ages, not just for children. Um, the other study that was presented was a gene therapy study, and I, I'm excited that there's many, many more ways of doing gene therapy. And the patient is doing well. Now it's six months, so we have to give it more time to see how long you know, this, it, this result um, lasts and if it translates to changing their overall outcome. But it's amazing that there's all this excitement and all this research happening in sickle cell disease. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty pumped. So gene therapy is relatively younger than the bone marrow or stem cell transplant. And they're trying to figure out ways of not just doing the gene therapy, but having the results endure for a longer period of time. So they're at the phase where they get good short-term results, but they need to be able to do that for more and more patients and then have those results last longer and longer, two years, three years, 10 years, right? Without you losing your gene product. With the um, haplotransplant, they figured out a way to reduce significantly the rates of rejection and the rates of graft versus host disease and to do older patients, right? And so it's, it's almost like if you do a good job with haplos and other forms of transplant, how you prep the patient, how you monitor the patient, gene therapy will benefit from all, from all that information. They will use the nuances of how to mobilize the patient with sickle cell disease or how to do supportive care to translate to when they do their gene therapy protocols to help the patients do better with the gene therapy um, process. There's a recognition that sickle cell has been an understudied, under-resourced, under-exposed population that is not a small population and the suffering and the magnitude of, of medical problems is huge and it finally has bubbled up to the surface. I think it's a mixture of ASH and the community coming together and saying, you know what, we need to be heard, we need to be seen, we need to be resourced and supported, and we need better therapies. It's embarrassing to say that in 2018, a disease that's 100 years old only has two FDA-approved drugs. And I think somebody kind of felt that embarrassment and decided, you know, we got to do something about it. And, and I'm excited that there's so many different partners. And we're learning from not just hematology field, we're learning from all different specialties. You know, we're learning from the neurocognitive people, the pain folks, the um, endocrine dermatology patients. There's different drugs that can be repurposed and used in sickle cell disease to improve outcomes. And so this ash is probably one of my most exciting ashes because there's so much out there for sickle cell disease. And actually, people who have never really thought about sickle cell disease as a career choice are thinking about, huh, there's a lot going on in sickle cell disease. I might want to look at this. And that's part of what we're trying to do is to bring in more people to be a part of the sickle cell treatment community, the sickle cell research community, because we need more and more people to take their expertise from wherever they are and bring it to this disease that is so understudied and so under-researched because the patients definitely deserve it. You know, and the potential to make a huge impact is unbelievable. If you do good work in America and you treat sickle cell disease well and take that knowledge to Africa, you will change the world. And that's why I'm excited. There's a couple of different initiatives right now that we've worked with, not just ASH, but HRSA and NIH and other groups to recognize that's a problem. So bringing the patients and the medical community together is a problem, right? And we're trying to fix that problem. So we have a, an initiative called expanding uh, education and mentoring to bring access to care. It's called the Embrace Network. It's a HRSA-funded initiative where we are charged with doing just that. Bring the patients, bring the medical community together, and begin this conversation about how do we improve care for sickle cell disease. I think if a doctor who does hematology or sickle cell disease sees a patient in their setting, hears about their struggle in, outside the clinic, they have a different perspective. If patients come to ASH, or come to meetings like this and see the passion and the enthusiasm about research in sickle cell disease, they will begin to engage more. And today at lunchtime, there's going to be a minority recruitment initiative lunch where I'll be doing a panel with a sickle cell patient who's in her 60s. And we're talking about how do you engage the community in research? 
How do you engage them in, in uh, shared decision making? How do you build a relationship with your patients so that they trust you enough to learn from you, to take the training you offer them, and also to bring in other patients into this initiative? And I think there's a lot of stuff going on. We've learned that if you keep sickle cell care or chronic disease care in the medical system, you're not going to reach your patients. We have to branch out into the community. We have to stop being so nervous or um, scared of being vulnerable. So I go to the community-based organizations. I sit with them, we have lunch, we talk. They see me in jeans and a t-shirt, and they see me in my lab coat. So I'm not the big bad wolf. I'm not like this scary person that they can't relate with. And then they understand that this is not about my career and being a big bad researcher. It's that I really care about the patient population, and I want their outcomes to be better. So I think if they see that passion and um, care that you have for the patient, the individual, it changes that interaction. And I think as providers, as doctors, we are trained to be very um, clinical, very detached. And it's hard to engage a, a, a disenfranchised population if you remain detached. You have to show a little bit about yourself. So I actually share with my patients my, some of my medical struggles, you know, in the right context. But I have a hard time drinking water. And I say, you know what, if you, you need to drink water for sickle cell disease, right? So how about if you drink 100 ounces, I drink 100 ounces. And we've had this challenge in my clinic where they drink 100 ounces and I drink 100. And it has changed how I see when I tell them to do stuff. It is actually hard to drink 100 ounces of water a day. It's very hard. You run into the bathroom. You're always trying to find, okay, is this, oh, no, don't drink this. Drink more water. It's, it's tough. So think about what they do every single day. Right? And as a provider, we tend to not think about life as the patient. It makes you a little bit more empathetic. You change what you assume as they don't want to follow, command, follow your instructions, they want to, they're non-compliant. It makes it a little bit different if you put yourself on their side of the track. So I really appreciate Ash's initiative where they're bringing patients into the conversation. What can we do to get you engaged? What can we do to make sickle cell a better condition that you have to live with? And I'm excited about that. The other thing that we're doing in, in, at my institution is we have a project with PCORI, the Patient Center Outcome Research Institute, and we're looking at pediatric to adult transition. We're trying to see how can we make life better for the 18 to 30 year olds so that when they leave pediatrics, which is very nice and comfy, and they go into adult care, that they don't die, that they don't end up you know, living in the hospital, or going to the ER every other day. And we're comparing a standardized structured approach of doing clinic with adding peer mentoring or not adding peer mentoring. And the trick is we're doing it with the community. So the pediatric doctor, the, the adult doctor, and a patient or a community representative are part of the research team. So that way, everybody buys in. And everybody wants it to succeed, and everybody's gonna get something out of it. And so you have this almost shared, this co-production thing going on where they get something out of it, we get something out of it, and the whole field gets something out of it. So again, this is the decade of sickle cell disease. I'm pretty excited.